Shalom. Given all praises, honor, and glory unto Yahweh, Bashem Yahushai, Bashem Raka Kodash. Double honors unto the apostles and the elders of the great millstone. Peace and salutations unto the Akiam, the brothers pushing this truth throughout the four corners of the earth in truth and sincerity, risking their lives and their freedom to do so now more so than ever. To the scattered, the speckled bird is right to be scattered among the heathen. I say Shalom. And I say Shalom unto the few and faithful Aqua, the sisters, listening and learning. This is your brother, Yerushalam, from GMS Prophetic Vibrations Camp, coming out of Trinidad and Tobago, coming at you with another video. Through the spirit and power of Yahweh, Bashem Yahushai, Bashem Rakakudash. Now, this video will be entitled Israelites in India. Alright? So, you know, because um, just as we read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. Verse 64, right? Israel is a scattered people, right? Right, Deuteronomy 28 and verse 64, it reads, And the Lord, Yehovah Hashem Yahushai, shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth. And before I read this, let me read verse 15. Deuteronomy 28 and 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord, Yehovah Hashem Yahushai, thy power, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Right? And we jump down to six, verse 64. This is a curse here. Right? And the Lord, Yahweh Bashem Yahushai, shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Right? So, hey, wherever we were scattered among all the nations, from one end to the other end, we were worshipping false gods, all of us, you know. When, you go, when it, that goes into Africa, it goes into India, alright, because what happened a lot, you know, if, in fact, the, the, the Israelites in India came from different sources, right? You know, some came out of the kingdom of Judah, right, as we will see, alright, um, some, some um, from, from even long before, the, 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 long before the, um, the birth of the Lord, from between 500 years before the birth of the Lord and 900 years before the birth of the Lord, Israelites, you know, were, were going into, into Asia, into India, all these places, right? And among the Elamites, right? And then um, we had um, we had during the sub-Saharan slave trade, you know, which which you know, we, the Israelites would have um, fled into Africa, right? From from many years, centuries, also even before the Mashiach, I wish I was born, right? Even up to the point of seventy A.D., right? Where where we read from the book Babylon, the Timbuktu, on page eighty-one. That um, we fled, over one million Hebrew Israelites fled into Africa to avoid Roman slavery and occupation, right and debt, right. So we settled in different lands around the east coast of Africa. You know, we were moved down around the, the, the river, the Niger River. You know, you know, and that's where they got, of course, the Nigeria. Nigeria meaning um, <clears throat> Niger area or Niger area, all right. And um, you know, from that time, you know, the 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 Arabians or the Ishmaelites were basically and the Hamites were slaving us. You know, were taking us, you know, were taking us across to Asia, parts of the Middle East, and selling us on ships, right? Which is called the Sub-Saharan slave trade, right? Which which was a slave trade that actually lasted for fourteen hundred years. You know, a much longer period than the transatlantic slave trade, right? So that that's the history behind it. You know, and it's so important to understand history because if you don't know the history you truly don't know the mystery as the apostles say all right so so we we, we are truly are scattered people you know and um you know we heard stories about great warriors you know israelite warriors you call it them africans but they're not africans like yasuke you know who was the who was the first so-called um black samurai right so-called black is an israelite man right and then you heard about Malik Amba, you know, who, who um, basically, these basically were Habshis, you know, what they call Habshi. Habshis are basically um, Israelite warriors and, you know, slave warriors, soldiers and, um, and, and mercenaries, you know, free mercenaries, was eventually some of them got their freedom, who, who literally um, were great warriors, you know, who, work in, you know, in, who came, came and were sold as slaves in India. And, they, and, you know, of course, as I was telling you, they call Habshis, all right? Um, and they rose to great prominence too, into kings and generals in India, you know, doing great exploits, 
and, and having great military prowess. You know, one of these, you know, one of these examples is um, as I spoke about Yasuke, who went to India and then went into eventually Japan right, and made a name for himself there. But there are also others, you know, other Israelites, all right, such as um, such as uh, Malak Amba, right, and Genghis Khan, who was before him. In what he was named after after the Genghis Khan, who was who was basically uh, I think he was I believe he was even a Moabite, all right. But this was an Israelite man, you know, who actually um who actually lived a great general, all right. So without further ado, I'm gonna go into a little history here, a YouTube video called Malik Amba. You know the word Malik means king in in the Arabian tongue. Well, you know Malak in Hebrew is king, all right. So so let's go into a little history of his captivity and how he rose to prominence. And now let's go into some scriptures here. The man who would become Malik Amba was born in 1548 in central Ethiopia with the birth name of Chapu. His people, the Oromo, were relative newcomers in the region, taking advantage of the instability caused by an ongoing war to migrate into the country. Chapu's childhood was a traditional Oromo peaceful pastoralist life. 16th century Ethiopia was a land defined by slavery. While it impacted all communities, Solomonic Christians and adult Muslims in particular targeted the largely spiritualist Oromos. By 1555, over 12,000 slaves per year were captured and sold in Ethiopia, stripped of their freedom and shipped out to serve elites from Cairo to the heart of Persia. Sure enough, at only 12 years old... So you see Cairo to the heart of Persia, right? Cairo to the heart of Persia. And, you know, that they show you right there, you know, the Persians were the Elamites, you know, and the Elamites live in, you know, India as well. Both um, Iran, modern day Iran, and um, India, you know, the kingdom was a huge, a huge kingdom. All right. Um, let me see if I can find out a scripture here. If not, I'll go on. All right. Um. Let's go here. Let's do this. Palace in Susa. Shushan. Yeah, you know, you know, um, let me see. Because, um, literally, there's a palace, I believe, Shushan. Let me see if I can go to the book of Esther. Esther 1. And, um, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days of Hazarus, you know, this is Hazarus, which reigned from India, right, even to Ethiopia. Right, so you see what, what's going on there from India even to Ethiopia, that's the, the um the Persian Empire, the Medio Persian Empire, right? From India straight to Ethiopia, right? And you know that I show you there. Over 107 and 20 provinces, right? That in those days when the king Ahasuerus, you know, which is Artaxerxes, sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace. Alright. Well, let me see if I can find where um Where's where Shushan is located? Spare with me a moment, yeah. Yeah, um Susa. Yeah, here they have Shushan, the citadel or palace of the Persian king, Ahasuerus, features heavily in the Bible book of Esther. The ancient city of Shushan was the capital of the kingdom of Elam until it was conquered by Cyrus the Great shortly before he went on to conquer Babylon. Alright, so Shushan was a 
city of the Elamites, right? Which are the Persians. Um, it says the site currently consists of three archaeological mounds covering an area around one square kilometer. The town, the modern Iranian town of Shush, is located on the site of ancient Susa. Right, so this was in Iran, right? But the kingdom ran straight into India, right? You know, which which the um the the Alexander the Greek, you know, didn't conquer. They couldn't get didn't get to go deep into India, right? To conquer to conquer India, the whole the whole kingdom, you know. You know, he conquered up to up to a certain portion, which the Lord stopped him from conquer um which the Lord put an end to him conquering, you know. Right? So, you know, that's that is the kingdom of the Elamites. So which, was, which was a huge kingdom. Um, let me just go back to the video here. Chapu was captured by Arabic traders, becoming a statistic in an epidemic slave trade that spanned across the Indian Ocean. So you see, it was an epidemic. You see the, the, that word again, epidemic slave trade, right? Which was so bad, it was 1,400 years, and here it's, it's those Ishmaelites who picked him up, right? And took him, you know, that during, this was during the sub-Saharan slave trade, all right? Sub Saharan slave trade period. All right, let's get um, sub Saharan slave trade. How long did the sub Saharan slave trade last? Right. Well, um, they say while it is difficult to specifically date the origin of the south of the trans-Saharan slave trade, it is possible to state that the trade reached its peak between the 8th and the late 1600s AD. Right? 16th century AD. So you see how long it went on for. Indeed, by the 10th century AD, North Africa was chiefly remarkable for black slaves. So, you know. Um, see if I can find something else here. thing is sticking right during the trans-saharan slave trade as they call it slaves from west africa were transported across the sahara desert to north africa to be sold to mediterranean and middle eastern civilizations so that's what was happening along you know during this period of time all right, um, let me go back to the video here. The young boy was put on auction in a slave market in a port on the coast of Yemen. Young, scared and alone, the boy likely wondered if he would ever see his home or family again. All right, so you can see that in the scriptures here. Um, Deuteronomy 28, verse 68. All right. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof ye spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there you shall be sold to your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you, no man shall redeem you, right? While auctioneers peddled him as if he was no different to the coffee beans, musk, ivory and silk on sale in the bazaar. Chapu was quickly sold, eventually ending up in the hands of a merchant named Mir Kasim, who took him to the restored cultural center of Baghdad. Kasim gave his slave a new Arabic name, Amba. He also taught him how to read, write, and manage the finances of his master's business. After a decade in the heart of the Islamic world, Amba was taken on a journey with Mir Kasim, who sought greater business ventures in more exotic lands. In 1571, the master and slave reached the west coast of India, a region known as the Deccan. As a young man in his early 20s, Amba had finally arrived in the place where he would make his mark on history.
Much like Ethiopia, the Deccan was a land defined by war, intrigue, and a delicate balance between its various peoples and religions. Politically, the plateau was divided into five sultanates, which typically were comprised of a ruling class of Muslim elites presiding over a mainly Hindu Marathi majority. Indo-Turks, Persians, and a smattering of European merchants also added to the land's social fabric. The rulers of this land walked along a dangerous edge. Violent coups were the norm, as sultans often found themselves slain at the hands of their own soldiers or via the work of rival sultanates. To compound matters, a new player had recently emerged in the game, the Mughal Empire. Founded by one Zahir din Mohammed Babur, the Turkic dynasty had swept into the subcontinent, destroying the declining Delhi Sultanate in 1526. The Mughals established themselves as an imperial juggernaut in northern India, and licked their chops at the prospect of expanding into the small and divided sultanates to the south. Upon arrival in India, Ambar was once more sold. In the Deccan, Africans were known as Habshis, and were commonplace as slave soldiers or free mercenaries. Ambar's new master was the chief minister to the Sultan of Ahmednagar, a man known as Chengiz Khan, a name invoking the conqueror of old. Chengiz had much in common with Ambar. He too was of African origin and had once been enslaved. Since then, he had earned his freedom and now commanded an army in the name of his lord, Mutaza of the Nizam Shahi dynasty. In meeting Chengiz, Ambar quickly learned that upwards mobility was possible for anyone in the Deccan, even a slave. Ambar began this new chapter of servitude as a soldier in training under his Habshi master. He was resolved to earn himself a higher position in life through determination and grit. He soon distinguished himself from the pack, catching Chengiz's eye with his impressive brawn, quick wit and thorough education. Chengiz soon decided to make him his personal aid, grooming him for leadership. Three years later, Ambar's sense of security was shattered once more. Courtiers jealous of Chengiz Khan's power had framed the minister for working against Ahmednagar, inducing the Sultan to have him executed. It was a harsh wake-up call to the reality of Deccanese politics. However, there was a silver lining. Following Chengiz's death, Ambar was legally a free man. After nearly two decades, the Oromo was in control of his own destiny. He traveled south to the neighboring Sultanate of Bijapur and enlisted in the local army. It was during this time that he met Karima, a fellow Habshi. Eventually, Ambar would marry Karima and have four children with her. As the Bijapuri ruler passed away, leaving an underage son as his heir, responsibility for the guardianship of the realm fell to the Queen Mother, a woman known as Chand Bibi. This regent proved to be incredibly competent. Well aware of the cutthroat nature of Deccanese politics, she introduced the concept of fidelity to the salt, which espoused loyalty to the land itself rather than any one dynasty. The Sultana, as she was called, had many admirers. Chief among them was Ambar, who saw her as a role model. In time, Ambar had risen up in the Bijapuri ranks and built a small but dedicated following of mounted warriors with whom he had likely distinguished himself in various small-scale border skirmishes. His loyalty to Regent Sultana and his effectiveness in battle led to Chant Bibi's young son bestowing upon him the symbolic title of Malik, an Arabic word for chieftain or king. The year was now 1595, and the Mughal Empire had finally turned their attention back to the Deccan after suppressing rebellions in the east. For Emperor Akbar, it was a good time to invade. Ahmednagar was racked by internal strife. The most recent Nizam Shah had died in a border war with neighboring Bijapur. In the ensuing power vacuum, none other than Chand Bibi laid claim to the throne through her nephew's Nizam Shahi blood. This caused the reigning Ahmednagari chief minister to make the fatal mistake of inviting the Mughals into his realm to protect his power. 
Sure enough, a mighty imperial host, led by Prince Murad Mirza, son of Akbar, descended down on Ahmednagar. Realizing he'd made a deal with the devil, the minister fled the country, and the warrior Sultana seized the mantle of resistance. At Fort Ahmednagar, Chand Bibi met the Mughal army with her own. Donned in full armor and an Islamic veil, she flung herself into battle alongside her men. Ambar had not been idle either. He had long since left Bijapur with his contingent of cavalrymen and joined forces with his sultana. He and his fighters harassed the Mughal army during the battle, destroying provisions and disrupting supply lines. Exhausted and demoralized after a fruitless siege, the imperial forces soon withdrew. For a scant few years, there was peace in Ahmednagar, with Chand Bibi as regent. But in a climate thick with paranoia, it was not to last. In 599, Bibi met her end in typical Dukhani fashion, slain by her own soldiers, who were fueled by a false accusation that she was selling Ahmednagar out to the Mughals. Without the leadership of this iron-willed woman, the Imperials fell upon Ahmednagar once more the next year, easily taking it and capturing Bibi's young puppet nephew, thereby decapitating the country's government. It was now time for Malik Ambar to take to the main stage. In honor of his sultana, he pledged his fidelity to the Sult. The Deccan was his home, and he would not let it fall. With Ahmednagar's rightful heir in captivity and its army in disarray, Ambar took up the Herculean task of piecing together the tattered scraps of a nation while fending off Mughal expansionism. Fortunately, he had never stopped preparing for war. By 1596, his relentless raids on Mughal territory had brought 3,000 soldiers to his side. By 1600, this number had swelled to 7,000. Persians, Turks, Habshis, and Marathi Hindus all joined the Abyssinian commander for... So you see, this was around the time, the time period of the sub-Saharan slave trade, the 1600s. Alright? You know? This is around that time. You know, and, and it does show you, he had, a, he, had a whole, he had a battalion as well of different soldiers and Habshis. So, you know, there was a steady supply of Israelite warriors coming from parts of Africa. All right. Plunder and freedom. The Mughals' conquest of Fort Ahmednagar granted them a tenuous hold on the Sultanate's capital city. Nevertheless, they found further ingress into Ahmednagari lands consistently foiled. Realizing he could never take the empire head on, Ambar employed the tactic he called Bagi Giri. The native Marathis in Ambar's army were legendary for their deadliness as light cavalry. Once his scouts had informed him of a Mughal position, he deployed the mounted Hindu warriors to strike like lightning, destroying food and water supplies and harassing Mughal soldiers. The imperial forces, over-encumbered with their heavy cannons and lumbering war elephants, simply could not keep up and without provisions were forced to retreat. Ambar had turned the Mughal army's greatest strength, its size, into its greatest weakness. Even while fighting a guerrilla war, Ambar still had a government to rebuild. Dikani nobles could never accept an African as their king, but Malik did not need a crown to rule. Yeah, because he's a jik, that's why, you know. And that's the curses. From neighboring Bijapur, he fished out a young heir of the Nizam Shahi family and installed him as Sultan Murtaza Nizam Shah II. Ambar offered the new sultan his daughter in marriage, tying himself closer to the royal line. As expected, the Oromo was appointed as Ahmednagar's regent minister by the puppet king he had installed, making him the de facto ruler of the revived sultanate. From 1600 to 1610, Ambar walked on a tightrope, balancing war with the Mughals with the inherent perfidiousness of Dukhani politics. In 1603, he put down a rebellion launched by three of his officers, all while feigning a treaty with the Mughals so that they would not take advantage of the situation. 1605 saw the death of Emperor Akbar, who was replaced by his son Jahangir. The new Mughal sovereign launched campaigns into the Deccan with renewed vigor, but the effectiveness of Ambar's Bagi Giri kept him at bay. 
Jahangir would struggle fruitlessly against the Abyssinian for decades, eventually growing so infuriated that he ordered an imperial portrait of himself shooting a decapitated Ambar in the head. This painting remained forever a fantasy for the wishful thinking. The emperor would never capture his cunning foe. In 1610, Ambar was subject to more court intrigue. Up until then, the puppet on Ahmednagar's throne had been a compliant stooge. Ambar's daughter was but one of Sultan Murtaza's many wives, and one of them, a Persian woman, had since turned him against the regent minister with hushed words of sedition. Once he caught wind of this, Ambar had both the wife and the Sultan swiftly assassinated, installing the five-year-old Burhan Nizam Shah III to the throne. No one would threaten the Malik's control, especially not the Sultan's whose power came only by his accomplishments. Later that year, Malik's forces stormed and occupied Fort Ahmednagar, seizing it from the Mughal garrison. Galvanized by the string of victories that followed, Ambar moved Ahmednagar's capital closer to the Mughal border. In 1612, a treaty was secured with the empire, and the Abyssinian potentate was afforded time to build up his new city and secure stability in his realm. Over the next decade, commerce flowed into the new capital, which today is known as the city of Aurangabad. Ambar worked tirelessly to improve the infrastructure of his realm, overseeing the construction of an aqueduct system that fed clean water to his capital and its surrounding suburbs, while actively maintaining and repairing the over 40 forts in his territory, ensuring he had touch points to spot the next Mughal invasion. Under his patronage, both Hindu and Muslim arts flourished, and palaces and mosques were erected to increase the prestige of Ahmednagar. Over the next few years, the truce with the Mughals was predictably broken, and fighting continued once more. In 1616, Ambar suffered his first major defeat against the imperial host, who used a system of trenches to entrap the Ahmednagari cavalry and devastate them with artillery. This loss gave the Mughals a stable foothold in Ahmednagar once more, and from there the situation continued to snowball. The Bijapur Sultan smelled blood in the water. Previously he had been an ally to Ambar in the war against imperial aggression, but by 1618 it became clear the Adil Shah intended to collaborate with the Mughals. Seeing their conquest of the Deccan as an inevitability, he conspired to destroy Ahmednagar for the preservation of his own realm. The noose was tightening around Malik's neck, and he knew he had to act swiftly, lest he be wiped from the pages of history. A spree of Bagigiri raiding in Bijapuri territory forced an allied Mughal Bijapuri army to meet Ambar on his own terms. On September 10, 1624, Ambar chose to make his stand in a fort within the village of Badvadi. The village stood on a hilly bluff overlooking the western shore of Lake Kalindi. It was the rainy season, so as the enemy's massive army approached, Ambar ordered the lake's dam struck and the lowlands flooded, turning the ground at the Mughal's feet into a thick, muddy bog. As he had done his whole career, Ambar turned his enemy's superior numbers and heavier units against themselves. Artillery, war elephants and infantry were wholly immobile in the wet hellscape that the Malik had created for them. Night after night, his Marathi cavalry sallied down the hillside while shrouded in darkness, destroying provisions and picking off the enemy. For the Mughal soldiers, the effect was thoroughly demoralizing. Gripped by terror and starvation, large chunks of the army defected to Ambar, who welcomed them warmly. With his army swelling and the Mughals shrinking, Ambar adjusted his doctrine and began attacking with wholesale cavalry assaults by day, devastating a foe that remained stuck in the mire and psychologically broken. Thoroughly beaten and incredibly humiliated, the Mughals were forced to retreat after sustaining heavy losses. Not only had Ambar once more humbled the mighty empire, he had foiled the attempts of his fellow Dikani Sultanate to collaborate in his destruction and ensured the independence of his realm. Alright, so so pretty much 
you know, that's just some history. Going back into the Malik Amba, you know, Israelite Jake, you know, you see the strategy, ability of Jake, you know. That's why Jake is called the salt of the earth, you know, Lord, Lord, we, we, we are special people, all right. You know, mm-hmm. special abilities, all right. But our strongest and our best hope is in, in Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai, right, who is our power, all right. That's why we call Yasharala, he the prince of power. Alright, so um you know with that I'm just gonna go and go through um a l article here quick. Um Israelites in India. Alright, first I'll show some images here. Alright, it's images of Jake in India, alright, as sultans and kings, you know. Alright, just like um Genghis Khan and Malikamba. Alright. See clearly here you can see that, right? can see right here the features all right southern kingdom more than likely leave this another one here it's a old picture here history of jews in india it's ancient pictures they have a lot of pictures um let me see if i can find here we go history of jews in india all right maybe we could go into let me go back here. Um, the Punjabi and the CD. You know, they, none of these devils here you see down here with the hat on their head. Um, the CD of India. Let me see if I can pull that up. CD. Alright, so these are the CDs here, which are, which are jigs. Alright, you can see that clearly, right? Pull this up. Alright. So these are the CD. Some of them look still still look so called black. Right? Still look brown skin of so called of is with Israelite features, you know, but there are millions more that look like so called Elamites. Alright? Because hey, when we went in these countries here, you know, when we were scattered, we took the woman, you know, as in into what they call the harem. So you see they they have a an Israelite man in front here and it looks like an Elamite behind serving alright so we took the woman so after um, a few generations right of, of mixing with the woman and we begin to look like them alright so it's just plain here let me just go back all Israelites in India alright history of the Jews in India the history of the Jews in India reaches back to ancient history you know, Judaism is one of the first foreign religions to arrive in India in recorded history. Alright, so, you know, we, Jake was in India for a long time, hundreds of years. Indian Jews are a religious minority of India, but unlike many parts of the world, have historically lived in India without any in instances of what they call anti-Semitism. Which is nonsense, because the, the Elamites are Shemites too. Alright? Um, while some Jews state their ancestors arrived in India during the time of the kingdom of judah right you know and the kingdom of judah was f- a, a long period of time all right judah was from about 586 bc straight to 9 or 930 bc to 586 bc almost a period of 400 years right before you know 500 586 years before the birth of yamashiach yawashai you know so that just shows you right there you know we we were we really truly scattered Right, and they have some groups in India that, that um, say they descend from the ten large tribes. Right, the Madras Jews, the Bene Israel, you know, all these people. Right? The 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 um you know a lot of a lot of them no longer following the Israelite customs, right? Following they following other customs, Hinduism, Muslim, right, like the Punjabi, you know, they wear that, that turban, right, with the hole on the top, you know, for the, you know, because a man full head is not supposed to be covered. Right, and now let's go back go into the scriptures here. We can see Isaiah 11 and um, verse 11. So, like, yeah, just bear with me a moment here. Isaiah 11 and 11, right? And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to, re- to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt. And from Patros in Assyria, he's going into the land of Nineveh, 
right, around the parts of Iraq and thereabouts, right? Egypt, you know where Egypt is? From Patros, Patros is southern Egypt. From Kush, which is Ethiopia, right? And you know they came from Kush. They went Kush. And from Elam, which is India, right? That, that goes both into Iran and India, the, co- the, the subcontinent. And from China, right? It's in Iraq and those places, right? And from Hamat and from the islands of the sea, right? You know, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So we have Judah, Benjamin, and Levi scattered to India and all those places along with the other tribes, you know. And now again, we can go in the New Testament and find that too. It says Acts chapter 2 and verse 5, it reads, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Right? Now listen to the nations. Right? Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. He heard the apostles speak in their own language, but that's truly what tongues is. Right? That's what tongues is all about. Speaking in tongues. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Yeah, you know, because the Lord gave them that gift of tongues, the Holy Spirit, through the whole power of the Holy Spirit. All right? And now, and how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, right? You know? Elamites mean from East Indians, you know, probably look like them too. Look like East Indians. Alright? That's why you can't be carnal in this thing. You have to keep spiritual. Because there are plenty of speckled birds around, right? So say Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, which is Iraq, area in the Middle East, and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia. Alright? So hey, you know, the Lord heritage is a speckled bird. Bird. Yeah, let me let me get that. Jeremiah twelve and verse nine. Jeremiah twelve and verse nine. It says, My heritage is unto me as a speckled bird. Right? The birds round about her are against about are against us. Wherever we scatter, you know, they're against us. We are always under the curses, always doing bad, always oppressed. Right? Because these are the other nations. Even if we look like them, my inheritance is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. Right? You know, because they, we, we scattered and around the place looking like different people, you know. And when you go into this word, this word speckle, it, 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 um, it basically refers to many colors. Strong's age, 6641. Savue. Savue. It means colored. Variegated, speckled, different colors, right? Dyed, dyed stuff. You know, different. You know, the Lord say we we different colors, right? Now we look different because we've been scattered to all these countries, and where they've been scattered, we've been we've been um we've been marrying these heathen women. You know, which which we where we take on our church and take on a different look. And right? we see that in the scriptures. You know, where where we had it, where in the Old Testament we had to um we you know, basically pledge pledge the um lineage, the patriar- patriarchal lineage. The paternal lineage, all right. You know, and as we saw in the scriptures, you know, a you know, in the books of Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, where the Persians had us captive, all right. From since back then, the Persian captivity, I believe, lasted for about two hundred years, around five thirty eight to three hundred and thirty two BC, all right. They ruled, they ruled over Israel, you know, they had they had domain, right. Until Cyrus the Persian, you know, let Israel go, you know. So so, that's. That's what's going on there. All right, let me go to another scripture here. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 19. It says, And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way, and according to their doings I judged them. All right? And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. All right? So, so they changed the Lord's name and profane the Lord's name. When they said to them, These, these are the people of the Lord, Yahweh Shem Yahushai, and are gone forth out of his land. Right? So they only heathen profane the, Lord, the Lord's name. Right? But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. So we, we, we are all around heathen. 
Yeah, we we all over. You know, we we a big portion of Israel. A lot of Israel is in is in India too. India is is the second most populous country in the world. I believe it's one billion people. So you can imagine the amount of jakes over there. All right. And if you go into the book Babylon the Timbuktu, you know, they, you know there are different um there are counts. Basically, of basically of um Israelites in Ethiopia, you know. I believe the black African Hebrews of Egypt and Ethiopia on page 76. Uh, it starts on page 76 and it goes down into it too as well. Basically that's showing how it is, you know, we you know we have a better presence in Ethiopia. Alright? So you know with that, I'll end it there. You know, I pray that this lesson has been edifying. I want to give all praises, honor, and glory unto your Hawa Bahashem Yawashai, Bahashem Raka Kodash, Wa Abad Babal Shalawam.